So I seem to have this sort of uncanny ability to zero in on the best bang for buck products in essentially any category that I'm interested in purchasing for. To that end, I built this computer right here. This is running a Xeon 8-core processor from a couple years ago on a Chinese motherboard that was specifically built to take these server CPUs or workstation class CPUs and build a consumer grade board for them, paired with 32 gigs of cheap RAM. The problem is that this is not performing as advertised. It benchmarks great, but in real world performance, I'm finding that it's performing even slower than my previous system. So I've ordered some new parts, some new really good bang for buck budget parts. And in thinking of putting this video together, I decided instead of just upgrading my computer, I figured we're all in uh, social distancing, we're all in quarantine, why not take this time to kind of introduce some people to the best kind of cheap components that I can find to make a decent computer for either doing workstation stuff or for gaming. And I'm gonna do three price levels. I'm gonna start with the build that I've put together here at the cheap price. Then we're going to go to a cheaper price to make some cuts to bring the budget down another $200. And then we're going to, to go to the cheapest tier where I bring it down all the way to $250 and you can still get something decent for gaming. And something that's very important for all of these builds is they're all going to have an upgrade path. So you can start with something cheap and upgrade to something even better later down the line when you get more money. So let's get into it. Let's start with the build I put together for myself. This is the most expensive config of the bunch and the one with the fewest possible compromises. If you want to game respectively at 1080p or if you want to do some decently complex work like video editing, CAD, or design work, this is probably the config I'd go with. Starting at the exterior, the case I recommend for this build is the NZXT H510, which is currently $70 over on Amazon. Now, the eagle-eyed among you might notice this is not the case I used for my build, and that's just because I bought my case years ago for an older system, and it isn't sold anymore. Now, cases can be a rather contentious component because aesthetic and taste vary wildly, but I feel the H510 is a fantastic chassis to build in, while also being affordable, and the understated design still looks pretty nice. It's also a mid-tower, and while you could get away with a more compact chassis, especially considering the motherboard I'll be recommending, first-time builders will benefit greatly from just having more raw space to work with in their initial build. You'll already be nervous enough without the added stress of having to worry about careful part placement and excess cable management. Extras like a tempered glass side panel, generous cable routing options, a front mounted USB type C port, and a PSU shroud are just icing on the cake. Moving on to the inside, we need something to power all the hardware we're going to be buying, and I'd recommend the Corsair CX550 if you want to get some decent bang for your power supply buck. $70 can seem steep for a power supply, but this is not an area you want to cheap out in. Cheap power supplies can be unreliable, and if they die, they can potentially take other components out with them. I've learned that the hard way. For your money here, you get a quality brand and an 80 plus bronze certification, plus a 5 year standard warranty, which hopefully you won't end up needing. It lacks modularity, but any unused cables can be neatly tucked away since we're building in a relatively spacious chassis. At 550 watts, it has more than enough headroom to power our system, as well as more powerful components you may want to upgrade to down the line. Now to get to the more exciting components. The heart of this build is the Ryzen 5 1600 AF from AMD. This is a 6-core, 12-thread CPU for only $85, which blows the doors off the closest price part from Intel, the i3-9100F, which only has 4 cores and 4 threads. If all that sounded like gibberish to you, just know that in general, the higher the core count and the thread count, the better at heavier applications the processor can handle. This will give you a decent amount of breathing room and productivity in gaming alike. Next up is the motherboard, and for my build I chose the Gigabyte Aorus B450M. It's a micro ATX motherboard which balances compactness with expandability, while also having some nicer creature comforts cheaper boards tend to lack, such as an M.2 slot, a plethora of USB 3 ports, and heat sinks on the chipsets. It's about $80 at the time of writing this, and it's a solid platform to build off of that will keep up with you nicely as you expand your system over time. Up next is RAM, and I've chosen a 16 gig kit of Corsair Vengeance 3200 MHz memory. What I like about this RAM is that it gives you everything you need without wasting anything on bling, like RGB lighting or exorbitant heatsink designs. $80 gets you simple, utilitarian dims that just get out of your way and get to work. The speeds and timing are also pretty good, being a decently clocked pair of DDR4 sticks, so multitasking productivity apps or playing higher end games won't be much of an issue. 16 gigs has been the sweet spot for enthusiasts for a while now. 
so you'll be sitting comfortable for at least the next couple years. Next up is storage, and we're actually going to grab a pair of drives so we can have our performance cake and eat our capacity too. For our main boot drive, we're going to take advantage of the B450M's M.2 slot and get a 256 gig Western Digital Blue NVMe SSD. NVMe drives are stupid fast, and having our OS installed on it will make booting and opening applications happen near instantaneously. And at $55, it's pretty affordable too. 256 gigs isn't a ton of space though, so for raw storage, we're going to pair this with a 1TB traditional hard drive, also a blue from Western Digital, for $44. This will work great for storing project files or an ever-growing Steam library. Speed obviously doesn't hold a candle to an SSD, but if we're just storing files on it instead of loading applications, it won't be nearly as big of a deal. Games potentially could benefit from improved loading times being stored on an SSD, but the improvements aren't very dramatic, and at this budget, the money for that terabyte SSD would be better spent elsewhere. Which brings us to the component everyone was probably waiting for, the graphics card. My particular build is running the AMD RX 588 gig, and I think for 1080p gaming, there's no better budget choice. $170 gets you 60 FPS on medium to high settings in most games. For example, I played Doom Eternal on my RX 580 at 1440p, maxed out on Ultra Nightmare, and it was buttery smooth. Not every game is as optimized as Doom, but there's nothing I've thrown at this card that I haven't been able to play. The only sticking point here would be if you're planning on doing lots of work in the Adobe Creative Suite, particularly video editing, either in After Effects or Premiere. Adobe Media Encoder doesn't seem to get along all that well with AMD cards, so if this is something you plan on doing heavily, I'd suggest instead spending an extra $10 and getting an NVIDIA GTX 1650 Super. Performance is pretty close to the RX 580, but you'll also get better render times in Adobe's apps. The trade-off is that it only has half the video RAM, so going forward it may struggle in newer titles with higher resolution textures. But but neither of these cards are insanely powerful, so it's not a deal breaker in my book. They'll give you a better experience in consoles, but they're not the best the PC Master Race has to offer. And there we have it. Our part list tops out at around $655 at the time of writing. I mentioned at the top that upgrade paths were an essential part for all these builds, and this system is ripe for growth potential. The motherboard is really the key for doing that. The AM4 platform that AMD is currently using is compatible with pretty much all of their CPUs that have come out in the past three years. So while you're buying a relatively cheap $85 processor now, you could always upgrade down the line to a much more expensive Ryzen 7 or even Ryzen 9 CPU without replacing anything else on your system, considerably improving performance, especially multi-threaded work since these chips have more physical cores than the Ryzen 5. By using two sticks of RAM, we can upgrade down the line to 32 gigs by simply buying another kit later and dropping it into the remaining DIMM slots on our motherboard. I've actually already done that with my system thanks to a generous donation of both RAM and a processor from one of my patrons, Forgotten Paladin. Shout out for being awesome, dude. The case has ample space for additional hard drives and SSDs, so if the one terabyte drive we have now gets filled with our Steam library, it's easy to drop in another one without having to migrate your games that are already installed. And our power supply is enough headroom to support upgrading later to something like an RTX 2060 Super or Radeon 5700 XT if we want to move a bit closer to the bleeding edge of visuals, game at higher resolutions, or get a 144Hz monitor and play competitive titles at higher frame rates. But what if your budget can't exactly handle a $650 build? Well, we can nip and tuck a bit with our previous config and bring the price down by nearly $150 without making too many sacrifices to our overall experience, while still leaving an upgrade path for us to grow with later down the line. Not everything is going to change. For this cheaper config, I still think the motherboard and CPU are worth holding on to. The 1600 AF punches so far above its price point, nothing else in its class makes sense to step down to. And the expansion possibilities on the B450M will be even more important at this lower price when we're making some sacrifices now to get the ball rolling. There are cheaper motherboards, but they're far less feature rich, essentially making them dead ends for our build. The first thing I'd suggest changing is the case. We can save $15 by swapping out the H510 for the Corsair Carbide 100R, which is currently $55 on Amazon. It gives up a bit of the elegance of the NZXT case, but is a solid chassis that doesn't lack the essentials. It also gains some optical drive bays, so if you want to include a Blu-ray drive or DVD burner, this might be the better choice. The next cut is with RAM. We're going to half our 16 gig kit down to just 8 gigs. 8 gigs of RAM is the absolute minimum amount of memory I'd recommend for any build. You can still certainly get by doing productivity and gaming on 8 gigs. My previous machine before the failed Xeon experiment had only 8 gigs of RAM and I edited a bunch of IM Games videos, streamed, and played Sekiro no problem. 
but you'll be lacking some headroom going forward. Still, an 8 gig kit from Patriot comes in at only $38, so we're saving 42 bucks here. Next is the power supply. I know I said not to cheap out here, and we aren't, but we can still save a few dollars by swapping out our Corsair for a 500 watt Thermaltake Smart PSU. At only $48, it's still 80 plus certified, if at the lower white level instead of bronze, and it still gives us room to grow upgrading our system. Most importantly though, we shave another $22 off our build. Storage is the next compromise. I struggled here for a bit, but in the end I decided the best option was to split the difference and ditch both the NVMe SSD and the spinning hard drive and go with a 480 gig SATA SSD from SanDisk. While a SATA SSD isn't as fast as an NVMe drive, it's still plenty fast for daily use and the capacity is double the SSD in the previous build, so we can still install a few games before filling the drive up. Just using a 1TB hard drive by itself would allow us to install more games and cost less, but the degradation and overall user experience I feel is a step too far. For only $60, we can save another $39 for our overall system cost. The most painful cut though comes with the graphics card. If you still want the best gaming experience possible at this price point, you could stop here. But for the sake of completion, I feel a more significant price reduction is necessary and there's really nowhere else to cut. Instead of the RX 580 or 1650 Super, I'm gonna suggest instead the RX 570. At just $130, you're looking at around a 34% reduction in performance for $50 savings. You'll still be able to play games at 1080p, but newer titles will probably need to be dialed down to medium settings to get higher frame rates. If you're primarily just doing productivity work and are only going to be playing games casually or just want a card to accelerate your apps, Adobe notwithstanding, an RX 560 is only $99, but is literally less than half the speed of an RX 580, so you're giving up a lot for only a marginal savings. Only go this route if you don't plan on doing much gaming. If we stick with the RX 570 though, we're up to a total savings of $146, bringing the total cost down to about $509 in total as of writing. Upgrade options are still plentiful with this build though, and I'd argue they're more imperative to get a better experience now, as opposed to the $650 build, which is more about growing with you in the future. The first thing I'd change is grabbing the aforementioned one terabyte hard drive from the last build, especially if you're gaming. Steam eats up tons of storage, so the quicker you can offload your library onto its own drive, the sooner you can stop juggling files. This will be a simple addition, since the case and motherboard both support multiple drives, and that leaves you with a 500 gig SSD you can use for applications that, while not as fast as an NVMe drive, is still perfectly serviceable. RAM would be my next upgrade. Another 8 gig kit will bring you up to 16 gigs without having to replace the RAM you already bought, thanks to us not cheaping out on our motherboard. The 1600 AF will still be solid for a while, so at this price bracket I'd let it be for now. It's not something you really have to consider, at least for a while. The graphics card was one of our biggest budget cuts in this bracket, so if you want a game, putting some money later towards something like a GTX 1660 Super for $300 will cost almost as much as this entire system, but will perform leagues better than the RX 570 and even the 580 from the last build. And thanks to our decent power supply, we can swap it in without worrying about any constraints. But what if you need to go even cheaper than $500? Or, what if you're someone who's never built a PC before, and instead of going all in on a build, you'd rather dip your toes into working on computers before diving in full stop? What if you want to get started for as little money, and effort, as possible? Well, this is where the world of off-lease business computers come into play. We're going to set you up with a complete system for only $250, and at this price point, I find building is no longer the most efficient way to spend your limited money. Instead, we're going to upgrade an off-the-shelf business tower that companies are constantly unloading for pennies on the dollar. This allows us to save a ton of cash while also starting with a system already completely built instead of having to do it ourselves. This is what I did for the streaming PC we used throughout all of 2018 on the I Am Games Twitch channel. The pre-built I'm going to recommend here is the Dell Optiplex 7010. This is an older system, but still has everything we need to get started on gaming. A quad-core i5 processor that, while not as fast as the Ryzen 5 and the other builds, is no slouch, and can definitely still handle most modern games when paired with a decent GPU. It also has 8 gigs of RAM, a 1TB hard drive for storing our Steam library, and of course, all the other components like a case, power supply, and motherboard. All for just $150. You can't beat that value even when building. The one thing it doesn't have though is a graphics card, and this is where our first hurdle comes in when going this route. Since business computers are designed to do, well, business, they almost never include a graphics card, nor do they include a power supply decent enough to run a respectable card you might want to add in later. So we either have to run a low power GPU that can only do light gaming, or swap the power supply as well. 
If you want to get up and running with as little work as possible, I'd recommend pairing the Optiplex 7010 as is with a GT 1030 from Nvidia. It's only $100 and will work fine with the tiny power supply included with this computer. It's not really going to play anything more than esports titles like League of Legends or CSGO, but if you want to play older titles or get into emulation, this will do the job for just $250 for the entire system. If you want to upgrade this thing more though, we have options. Since it's a mid-tower, the motherboard supports four DIMM slots, just like the B450M in the custom builds from earlier. It uses older DDR3 RAM though, so we can't just drop the recommendations I listed earlier into this case. But DDR3 RAM is pretty cheap, so getting another 8GB and bringing the Dell up to 16 is simple enough. The power supplies though will drop right in, so if you want to have a crash course on cable management, feel free to choose whichever one suits your budget from the other builds and start swapping it in. A word of caution though, there are many more off-lease PCs than the model I listed here, so if this is out of stock and you want to grab another model, do your research first. Some manufacturers will use proprietary power supplies that can't be easily replaced. I learned this the hard way with the aforementioned IM Games streaming box. Some googling on whatever model you find will most likely answer any of these questions, so do your homework. Likewise, make sure you buy a tower model. Lots of business PCs use smaller, half-size cases. These not only won't fit a standard power supply, but also won't fit a standard size graphics card, severely limiting their usefulness for our purposes. Another thing to note is that, while raw storage isn't a concern with the 1TB hard drive included, without an SSD, performance and daily tasks will be a lot more sluggish than the previous builds. Without an M.2 slot on the board, buying a SATA SSD is your only option, and still well worth it, but this will also require either cloning your OS install or reinstalling Windows completely, which can be a cumbersome task to the uninitiated. The last caveat to note is that, since these are older computers, your upgrade potential for these CPUs are much more limited. While the Optiplex I recommended could be upgraded, you can't just throw a modern Core i7 processor in there like you can with AMD. Intel switches their CPU socket types almost every generation, so this board is only compatible with processors that came out at the time of its release. In this particular case, a third gen Ivy Bridge processor. And while you could upgrade to a third gen i7, the chip alone still costs around $100 for some reason, and the performance gain just isn't worth it in my opinion. Better to put that money towards the power supply and a better GPU. So there you go, that is my three budget options that I think are probably the best bang for the buck or some of the best bang for your buck that you can find on the market right now. So uh, links for all the products on Amazon are in the description. They are affiliate links, so they will help uh, support the channel if you choose to buy from there. However, they could be cheaper on Newegg or other sites. So if you can find a better deal on individual components, please feel free. Help yourself first, you know? Get it as cheap as you can get. That's clearly the point of this entire video. So if you can find better prices in other places, go ham. And obviously all these prices are for new components. If you can get used, if you're comfortable going on the used market on something like eBay, you can probably shave these prices even further. So that's, uh, that's what I got. Have fun building your computer, have fun playing PC games and getting tons of work done on your new pretty good budget system at whatever price bracket you decide to go with. And uh, remember to be the games you want to see and play the games you want to play and build the hardware you want to have to play those games. That was unplanned and you can tell. Talk to you all in the next one.